Okay, so this is this is fixation part. Okay. So before we begin the next section, we're just going to review what we have presented in the first presentation of this dispensation. We started with the baptism to the first simple cleansing. We saw 8027 parallel. We saw 8027 parallel 2019, and that was Jesus' baptism. So that's the priest's baptism. And then we saw that Jesus' fast. We saw look at Jesus' fast and temptations, which was the 40 days. And we saw that parallels right now and we saw that we are being tempted with um, presumption is the second one but turning a message for the nethanims into a message for us which is turning stones into bread that's the first temptation so the second one is presumption and then the third one is trying to take a yes no, no, that's third one. The wrong geography. Yeah, oh, yeah, that's right. Third one's the wrong geography. So it's taking the Democrats' perspective, perspective as, you know, thinking that everything's going to be fine if they can get Trump out of office. And that wrong geography. Can anybody, can, can you hear us? We can hear you. Very choppy. Your microphone is very choppy. Our microphone's it's what? Choppy. Oh, yeah, it says our speaker isn't working, if you heard that. Try again. Does that work? Is the audio clear now? No. Yes. Okay, can any, is it the audio clear? It should be better now. Yes, it looks like it's, it is still breaking. It's still breaking up? I'll talk more. Okay. Oh. Um. So we were looking at the 40 days and saw that the baptism began the 40 days. The temptations for Jesus were cast himself, well, turn stones into bread, presumption, and then well, my eyes, turn himself into bread, presumption, and then try to get all the worldly kingdoms for worshiping Satan. Hello, sorry, I missed a part of this lesson. Yes, oh. you'll be able to get the recording. So the temptations for us is turning a message for the Nethanims, a stone, into bread, a message. Turning, well, not turning, but presumption, it's the same in both histories. And lastly, taking the utopian message of the Democrats, the liberals, and thinking that's going to be what's happening. It's all wrong geography. So those are our three temptations. Then we saw that those three temptations will end when the 40 days ends, which is the increase of knowledge where Christ got bread, so we'll get bread there at the increase of knowledge. And lastly, at the marriage of Cana, which is the formalization, Jesus' message was formalized and he received 
power because he performed his first miracle. So that's where our message for this dispensation will be formalized. And then this dispensation ends at the first temple cleansing where Jesus begins his work and we will begin our work. Sorry, just sorry about that one. Okay, so next, next AD 31 was paralleling 2019, and that's where we saw the cross was the cross for the priest, except for Christ, everybody thought it was a failure, but it was not a failure. And for the priest, Beauty for America sent out an email mocking us saying nothing happened. When we know everything we said happened actually did, so they don't know what they were talking about. And it was success. And then the cross began, well, after Jesus was resurrected, which we can still mark as the cross way mark, began the 40 days. That's where Jesus reviewed his teachings with the disciples. And that's why we aren't receiving a new message right now because we are reviewing equality. The 40 days ends at the increase of knowledge where Jesus ascended. When he did, he sent two angels and they told the disciples that he was going to return. And that parallels our increase of knowledge that in 2020, which will tell us that, which will tell us more about the second coming, which is 2021. Then next is the formalization in this dispensation, which is the Pentecost part A. And that's where the disciples understand the message, which is all of Christ's, Christ's teaching, they finally understand the message. That parallels us where we will understand fully or clearly, we saw a quote that said clearly, what our mission is and what we have to do to teach the Levites. Finally, this dispensation will end in 2021, which is Pentecost part B. That's where the disciples began their work. And I also need to, forgot to mention that at the formalization, that's where the Holy Spirit is outpoured for us and for the disciples. But back to Pentecost Part B, which is 2021, that's where the disciples began their work. And that word was teaching the Gentiles, not the Gentiles, the Jews. And for us, that's where we began our work, which is teaching the Levites. And the last dispensation we looked at which is really the same when we parallel it to our line. But it began with the close of probation, which parallels 2019, which was beginning of the harvest for the Levites. No, harvest for the priests, sorry. And the harvest is the separating from the church, which is the stone from the mountain. And we saw a little illustration of how the stone is separated from the mountain. Basically by shaking, the mountain gets destroyed. You know, it all falls apart and you're left with the stone. This harvest for the priest ends at the second coming, which is 2021, where the priest will be done harvested, but the stone won't be completely separated from the mountain because the stone includes Levites, and the Levites aren't completely harvested until the Sunday law. So it's the end of us separating from the church, but not the complete end of the separation. And so... As the review, and now on to the close of probation to the second. So, the close of probation. The close of probation for us, the priest, was November, was November 9th, 2019. Because on the priest line, November 9th lines up with the close of probation on the 144,000th line. At the close of probation, no more people can be saved. After November 9th, no, no more people can become priests because the 30 years of preparation to be a priest is over. But the but November 9th was not a literal close of probation. It was just a type of Daniel 12 1. Jesus did not stop mediating for us then. That happens at Daniel 12 1, which says, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince with standards for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was, since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered. 
everyone that shall be found written in the book. November 9th, so November 9th for us priests parallels the close of probation, and it is the beginning of the last dispensation on our line. It's the beginning of the last phase of preparation. And just a quick note, feel free to interrupt or comment if you have a question or anything. We didn't say that at the beginning of this piece. After Jesus' res intercession ends, which is at the close of probation, the plagues will be poured out. Quote from Great Controversy 627, paragraph 3. When Christ ceases his intercession in the sanctuary, the unmingled wrath threatened to get those who worship the beast and his image and receive his mark, Revelation 14, 9 and 10, will be poured out. The plagues upon Egypt when God was about to deliver Israel were similar in character to those more terrible and extensive judgments which are to fall upon the world just before the final deliverance of God's people. End quote. End quote. We have seen that in our time, the close of probation was 2019, so there must be a plague after it. There is no doubt that there is a plague going around. This plague is the coronavirus disease 2019 or COVID-19. The coronavirus pandemic is the plague that parallels the plague after the close of probation. COVID-19 is not only a serious event externally, it's prophetic internally. We can prove that COVID-19 is prophetic through World War I as well. Okay, so to prove that COVID-19 is prophetic, we can look at World War I. And so now we are going to go into World War One. So it began in 19, not the actual war, but the whole history began in 1908. In October of 1908, Austria-Hungary annexed Bosnia and Herzegovina. This annexation caused many of the neighboring countries, such as Serbia, to protest. This crisis forever damaged the relationship between Austria-Hungary and the other countries around it, resulting in steps toward the First World War. Bosnia was a sphere of influence of Serbia, and they were also interested in expanding into it and Herzegovina. Serbia was one of Russia's sphere of influence, but Russia was too weak at this point to defend their interests. Russia had been defeated in the Russo-Japanese War of 1904 and 1905. At the time of the war, the Russian people also began to realize that their country was in need of reforms, and soon after, a revolution broke out. There were strikes and military mutinies. The Russian Revolution, lasting from 1905 to 07, and the loss of the Russo-Japanese War left Russia unable to defend Serbia when Bosnia was annexed by Austria-Hungary in 1908. So in 1908, Bosnia and Herzegovina was annexed by Austria-Hungary. And to annex, annex a country means to expand it to them. So like they made those two areas part of Austria-Hungary. And Serbia had wanted to expand into some Bosnia and Herzegovina, but since they had been annexed by Austria-Hungary, they couldn't. And Russia, who was who was its more powerful ally, could also not help Serbia. I guess you could say get them back, but they couldn't help Serbia and what they wanted to do because Russia had just lost the Russo-Japanese War, and they had also just lost. A revolution. Well, they were feeling the effects of the revolution. And so those things made Austria-Hungary get away with what they wanted to do. June 28, 1914. Serbia hated the Austria-Hungary that annexed Bosnia-Herzegovina. 
which contained more Serbs than any other ethnic group. And the Serbs that were there in Bosnia and Herzegovina didn't like that either. There was, an, there was an extremely powerful terrorist group in Serbia called the Black Hand, and it was made up mostly of army officers. And they worked to free Serbs outside of Serbia from foreign rule. In May of 1914, they gave weapons to three men who were part of a secret revolutionary society in Bosnia and then smuggled them out of Serbia, where they had met them, and back into Bosnia. They, the three men, have wanted the weapons because the heir of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Franz Ferdinand, was coming to Bosnia and Herzegovina. He was also the Inspector General of the Army, so he was going to attend some military events. He was warned not to go, though, because many people there didn't like Austria Austro-Hungarian rule, but he and his wife went anyway. After being there for a few days, on June 28, 1914, one of the three men who the Black Hand had given weapons to killed him and his wife. This terrorist attack enraged Austria, Austria-Hungary and gave them an excuse for a war with Serbia, which they had wanted for a long time. So on June 28, 1914, there was a terrorist attack from Serbia or from a group inside Serbia against Austria-Hungary, which we'll, we'll get to what it represents later. July 23rd, 1914. On July 23rd, 1914, Austria-Hungary sent an ultimatum to Serbia. Austria-Hungary demanded that Serbia end all anti-Austrian activities, punish any Serbians involved in the assassination of Franz Ferdinand, and allow Austria to conduct an investigation into the assassination, despite the fact that Serbia was already doing an investigation. Austria-Hungary demanded an answer within 48 hours. Serbia complied with all of the requirements except the one that would allow Austria-Hungary to conduct an investigation. This did not satisfy Austria-Hungary, who was already set on war. So on July 23, 1914, Austria-Hungary sent an ultimatum to Serbia. July 28, 1914. Austria-Hungary continued to be angry at Serbia for killing Franz Ferdinand. On July 1, 1914, Germany had told Austria-Hungary that they would support them if Austria-Hungary chose to fight Serbia. Germany had also told them, which was Austria-Hungary, on the next day, that if they wanted to fight to hurry because the German army was ready to fight more than Russia who had been backing Serbia. On July 28, 1914, Austria-Hungary declared war on Serbia and invaded them. Since Serbia was their sphere of influence, Russia began rallying its troops to fight Austria-Hungary. Germany, who was backing Austria-Hungary, declared war on Russia soon after declare war on Russia soon after, and other countries began taking sides. The two sides in World War I were the central powers, which were Germany, Austria-Hungary, the Ottoman Empire, and Bulgaria. The other side were the Allied powers, and they were Great Britain, Russia, the Trim which were the Triple Entente. Great Britain, Russia. Sorry. Oh, Great Britain, Russia, and France. They were the triple on time. And then there was also Japan, Italy, and the United States. And they were actually the social power. Yeah. The United States was. But all those countries could be grouped as the allied powers. So July 28th was the beginning of both fronts of World War I. So on July 28th, Austria-Hungary invaded Serbia, which caused Germany, not Germany, Russia, to declare war on Germany, and, is that right? Oh, no. Austria-Hungary invaded Serbia, which made Russia start 
wanting to fight Austria-Hungary and Germany declare war on Russia. And that all began the first, the two fronts of World War I. November 8, 1917. By 1917, Germany was tired of the war on the Eastern and Western Front, so they devised the plan. In April, they sent Vladimir Lenin, a Russian revolutionist, exiled in Switzerland, back to Russia. He was a Bolshevik, and and he wanted to overthrow the Russian government and establish a communist government. He also wanted to end the war on the Eastern Front, which was Germany versus Russia. So Germany decided to try to help him get in power so he could stop the war between Russia and themselves. There was a revolution already going on in Russia. The Tsar had abdicated on March 15th, and the Russian provincial government had been set up. Germany sent the Bolsheviks money and weapons to aid the revolution that they were starting. So in November on the Gregorian calendar, in October on the Julian calendar, and in Russia they were using the Julian calendar, Lenin and the Bolsheviks overthrew the government that had been put in place after the Tsar abdicated. On November 8, 1917, they took control of the Winter Palace, and that was the last obstacle before they had complete control of Russia. After the Bolsheviks took over Russia, Lenin became the leader, and he began to change Russia and do exactly and do exactly what Germany had sent him there to do. So on November 8, 1917, Germany decided to try to end the pressure of the war on themselves. So they sent, well, not on November 8, in 1917, they sent Lenin to Russia to try to end the pre- to try to end the war on the Eastern Front. March 3rd, 1918. On March 3rd, 1918, the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk was signed between Russia and the Central Powers, which included Germany. In this treaty, Russia agreed to stop further invasions, succeed territory to Germany, and pay Germany a lot of money. In simple words, Russia surrendered to Germany. This was the end of the Eastern Front of World War I. So next after March 3, 1918 came the Spanish flu. The Spanish flu pandemic began on March 11, 1918. It was called the Spanish flu because it broke out in the time of World War I and during the war, most countries did not have free media. Spain, who remained neutral throughout the war, did. So they began reporting on it first. That's why other countries thought it originated there. The Spaniards called it the French flu, the French flu though. However, it most likely originated in New York State. It infected one third of the world's population and killed 20 to 50 million people. At the time of the outbreak, there were no drugs to cure it and hospitals became overloaded. Citizens were, citizens were told to stay home and wear masks, especially higher risk people like those over 65 years old and with other medical conditions. Having people stay at home was detrimental to the economy, but the Spanish flu was highly contagious. It could travel through the air from a sneeze or cough and and infect a nearby person through their nose, eyes, or mouth. It originated from birds. The reason it spread so quickly and was so widespread is because soldiers were carrying it around the world and citizens lived in very close quarters and did not practice good hygiene back then. Also, a lot of people were simply weakened from the war. So 
On March 3rd, the treaty was signed, and eight days later, on March 11th, the Spanish flu broke out, and it could affect people through the air, through their eyes, nose, and mouth, and everybody was told to wear a mask or stay home, and that was destroying the economy, but it was highly contagious. And it began, or came from birds. November 11th of 1918. World War One began to end as Germany, Austria, Hungary, and the countries that were on their side, the Central Powers, began to be began to be deleted, began to be defeated by the Allies. On November 11th, 1918, the countries who were against Germany signed an armistice with them, therefore making November 11th, 1918, Armistice Day. The terms of the armistice included the withdrawal of German troops from enemy territories, the demobilization of the German army, the release of prisoners Germany held captive, and other regulations. Germany, who had been defeated, had no choice but to accept the terms. Though so November 8, 1918, the fighting in World War I stopped. June 28, 1919. On June 28, 1919, World War I officially ended with the Treaty of Versailles. The President of the United States, Woodrow Wilson, in January of 1918, had given a speech to the U.S. Congress known as the 14 Points, which was about how he wanted the world to look after the war. Germany liked his ideas, and when the fighting stopped, as we have seen on November 11th of that year, they thought the peace treaty that would actually end the war would mirror President Wilson's ideas, but it didn't. There was a conference in early 1919 called the Paris Peace Conference where the peace treaties that ended World War I were drafted. The main three drafters were Davis Lloyd George, Prime Minister of Great Britain, Georgia Clemenceau, Prime Minister of France, and Woodrow Wilson, President of the United States. Another important leader there was the Prime Minister of Italy. The Central Powers had no say-so in the treaties and were not allowed in until their respective treaties were written, and the Bolshevik and Russian government was excluded altogether, though they had already signed the treaty with Germany ending the war between them. Okay. Okay. What did I say? Bolshevik, Russian, but he said Bolshevik and Russia. Oh. Bolshevik, yep. Russian government was excluded. That's a big thing. The most prominent and the first treaty was the Treaty of Versailles. It was to be between Germany and the Allied and the Associate Powers. The treaty was very hard on Germany. It said they were the main cause of the war. It made them give up some of their territories. It put limits on their military and it made them have to pay a lot of money to the Allies for the damage caused by the war. This made the Germans mad, but the Allies threatened to invade Germany if they didn't agree to sign it. So on June 28, 1919, the Treaty of Versailles was signed by Germany and the Allied and Associate Powers, excluding the United States, which didn't ratify the treaty, so it made another one with Germany later. Germany now saw that they had lost the war badly. With the Treaty of Versailles, World War I formally ended. So this is the line of World War I. And, and I went to both. And World War I parallels World War II. So to summarize the line of World War I, we started in 1918 which was the Bosnian crisis. Austria-Hungary took Serbia's sphere of influence, Bosnia and Herzegovina. Bosnia had wanted to expand it to them. So when Austria-Hungary annexed them, they were mad, but its powerful ally, Russia, couldn't help them because Russia had lost a revolution and a war. Next, on June 28, 1914, there was a terrorist attack 
where Franz Ferdinand was killed. And because of that, Austria-Hungary sent in, the Franz Ferdinand was killed in Serbia. So because of that, Austria-Hungary on July 23rd, 1914, sent an ultimatum to Serbia, telling them that, giving them some regulations of what they had to let Austria-Hungary do if they wanted, well, let Austria-Hungary do because of what Serbia's, what well, the Serbs had done. You said 1918. I said 1918. I meant 1908 in the way mark before the one I just read. So they sent them Serbian ultimatum because of the assassination. But on July 23rd, since 28th, since Serbia had, re what is the word? Serbia hadn't fulfilled all the commands. Austria-Hungary invaded Serbia. Next, on November 8th, 1917, Germany sent Lenin to Russia to end the war because Russia had began to fight Germany for invading Serbia since Serbia was a sphere of influence of Russia. So Russia sent, Germany sent Lenin to Russia to end the war and Lenin did. And on March 3rd, the Treaty of Brezhnev was signed, which, in which Russia basically surrendered to Germany. And next, on November 11th, 1918, was Armistice Day, where all the Allies made Germany surrender in the war. And the war officially ended on June 28th, 1919, with the Treaty of Versailles. And Germany saw that they had officially lost the war. And the thing to mention is the Treaty of Brestetov was very harsh on Russia, just like the Treaty of Versailles was very harsh on Germany. Yeah, the Allies said since Germany was so hard on Russia, they had they were all hard back on Germany. Yes, so that is the world, the line of World War One and the top, and now we're going to be lining up World War Three, which is our history under it on that line you see there. So 1989, from the line of World War One, we saw that the Bosnian crisis of 1908, we saw the Bosnian crisis, Austria-Hungary, a two-horned power which represents the King of the North took Serbia's sphere of influence, Bosnia. At the time, Serbia's more powerful ally, Russia, was too weak to defend Bosnia, to defend Serbia's interests. Russia had just lost a war with Japan and was still under the effects of the 1905 revolution. In 1989, the United States who is also a two-horned power, which represents the King of the North, took Iraq's sphere of influence, Kuwait, in the Gulf War. At the time, Iraq's more powerful ally, Russia, was too weak to help Iraq. Russia had just lost the Cold War and was still under the effects of it. So 1989 parallels 1908. We both saw a major country would say take a smaller country's sphere of influence but that smallest country's major yes the major country is a two horn power king of the north took the smaller country's sphere of influence but the king of the south who was back in the smaller country was too weak both times by a war and one time by a revolution as well it was too weak to defend the smaller country's interests Two thousand and one. On June twenty eighth, nineteen fourteen, there was a terrorist attack, which parallels a terrorist attack in two thousand and one in our history. On June twenty eighth, nineteen fourteen, the Franz, the Archduke of Austria Hungary, Franz Ferdinand, was killed from a terrorist organization that was in Serbia. On 9-11, there was a terrorist attack against the United States. In both, in both histories, the terrorist attacks are against the King of the North. 
So in the history of World War I, it was against the King of North Austria, Hungary, a two-horned power. And in our time, it was against the United States, which is the King of North and also a two-horned power. Also. Um, well, yeah, characteristics of the King of the North. Also, in war, the history of World War I, the real King of the North is actually Germany. But yeah. since Germany was on the side of Austria-Hungary, we can mark both of them as the King of the North. That's how we can say Austria-Hungary and the stuff that, happened, that didn't happen to the King of the North. 2003. World War I tells us that there is an ultimatum after 9-11. The ultimatum in the history of World War I was a list of demands from Austria-Hungary, which was the King of the North to Serbia, one of the King of the North's sphere of influence. And they gave them just 48 hours to accept to do them. On March 17, 2003, George W. Bush gave Saddam Hussein, the leader of Iraq, which is a sphere of influence of Russia, who's the King of the South, he gave him 48 hours to get out of Iraq and to take his sons with him, or the United States would attack. Saddam Hussein, however, didn't listen and instead prepared his country for war, just like Serbia didn't fulfill all the demands from Austria. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. March 19, oh, just a second. March 19, 2003, and this is the way, same, same year as 2003, but different date. From the line of World War I, on July 28, 1914, Austria-Hungary, the King of the North, invaded Serbia. Serbia was a sphere of influence of Russia, the King of the South. On March 19, 2003, the United States invaded Iraq. Iraq was also a sphere of influence of Russia in this history. In these histories, we see that the King of the North invaded a sphere of influence of the King of the South. March 19, 2003, the United States invaded Iraq, just like on July 28, 1914, Austria-Hungary invaded Serbia. Both times, the King of the North invades a sphere of influence of the King of the South. I think the ultimatum against Iraq was March 17. So it was exactly 48 hours, but yeah. counting the dates. So November 8, 2016. From World War I, November 8, 1917, lines up with 2016 in our time. On November 8, 1917, Lenin, who had been sent to Russia, and Russia is the king of the south, by the Germany, so Lenin was sent to Russia by Germany, who was the king of the north, he took over the Russian government. World War I is an alpha history, as we know, and so in our history, the Omega, you flip the players. So in our history, it's the King of the South sending someone to the King of the North. In 2016, Russia began interfering in US, US's elections in Trump's favor. This parallels Lenin being sent to Russia in 1917 so he could take over the government because Russia, who was sending Trump to the United States was the King of the North to take over the government or destroy the government. On November 8, 1917, Lenin took control of Russia. He took his last obstacle. And on November 8, 2016, Trump won the most delegates, um, essentially making himself the president, although there's another election, but everyone knew he was going to be the president on November 8th or 9th, 8th. The vote was on the 8th. So Trump took over the United States government on the 8th, or began to. This was what Russia wanted. They wanted to send 
Trump hears and we get destroyed in the United States. So November 8th, 1917 parallels November 8th, 2016. And that lines up with Atkinson. November 9th, 2019. As we know, 2019 was the Battle of Rafia where the United States fought an information and proxy war with Russia. Russia, the king of the South, won and took many of the United States' sphere of influence. Many of Donald Trump's decisions that led to Vladimir Putin getting those spheres of influence were against the advice of his experienced officer, officials. He basically surrendered his spheres of influence to Russia. The Treaty of Brezhnev in World War I lines up with 2019. There, the king of the South, Russia, There, the king of South Russia surrendered, surrendered to the king of the north, Germany. World War I is in an athlete history, so we flip the battles when we make application to our line. Therefore, in our time, the Treaty of Brezhnev symbolizes the USA surrendering to Russia. The year 2019 was the defeat of the United States and the end of part one of the Eastern Front. So 2019 is the Battle of Rafia, although we have it under November 9th, but we know all of 2019 was part of the battle, and that lines up with 1918. COVID-19. As, as we have seen, the Treaty of brest parallels the Battle of Rafia in 2019 which was a victory for Putin. Unfortunately, right after the treaty, a pandemic hit the world. The Spanish flu was unexpected and claimed tens of millions of lives. The reason it was spread so much is because everyone was weakened by the war. And we know that war is World War I. So in our time, just like in history, COVID-19 hit the world right after the Battle of Rafia when people were weakened from the war, which is the battle. The first known case of the virus was on November 17, 2019. That's just eight days after November 9, even though Rafia was more, on, was more than on that one day. The Spanish flu was so widespread because of the war. That means COVID-19 is so widespread because people are weakened by the war, which is about Rafia. Rafia was an information war. That means people were not weakened physically. They were weakened in the head by Trump's conspiracy theories. Therefore, the real threat of COVID-19 is not the hundreds of thousands of lives it has claimed. The danger is the conspiracy theories about it because that is where people are weak. So, eight days after Rafia, COVID-19 hits, pandemic, just like the Spanish flu, same characteristics. Twenty twenty one. From the line of World War One, we saw that on November eleventh, nineteen eighteen, Germany was the king of the north, surrendered to the Allies. This was from an alpha history. So in an omega history, which is our history, in 2021, we will see Russia, who was the king of the south, surrendered to the king of the north. The Sunday Law. At the end of World War I, in 1919, the King of the North, Germany, was officially defeated. This date lines up with the Sunday Law in our history. World War I is an alpha history, so it is flipped to the King of the South being defeated in our Omega history. The King of the South, who is Russia, will actually have been defeated since 2021 
while Germany had been since 1918. But those defeats were just deadly wounds, which resulted in the death of those two powers. The Treaty of Versailles at the end of World War I, and for Russia in our history, the Sunday Law. So at the Sunday Law, Russia dies, and that is the end of World War I, on, which is really World War III in our time, which started, which started in March. 2003. Yeah, March 19, 2003. So, to summarize the line before we focus in on some. So, we saw World War I from 1908 to 1919, and we paralleled that with our history from 1989 to the Sunday Law. 1989 was the Gulf War where the United States, the King of the North, took Kuwait, which was a sphere of influence of Iraq. They took Kuwait from Iraq in the Gulf War. They really kicked Iraq out of Kuwait, but they essentially took it from them. And Iraq is a sphere of influence of Russia, the King of the South. But Russia, or the USSR in that time, was too weak to help. In 2001, there was a terrorist attack against the King of the North, and that was 9-11. In 2003, the United States, the King of the North, sent an ultimatum to Iraq, telling them, telling the leader to leave because the United States did not like Saddam Hussein, but he didn't listen. On March 19, 2003, the United States invaded Iraq, and that began the Iraq War. On November 8, 2016, the King of the South, Russia, has successfully, successfully sent Trump to America to overthrow the government so that the King of the South, Russia, could get more power. On November 9, 2019, the Battle of Rock, November 9, 2019, was, I guess you could say, the end of the Battle of Rock, yeah where the United States surrendered to Russia because we know it is split. The, applicant, the history of World War I is split in our time. In 2021, the Battle of Panium, Russia, the King of the South, was surrendered to the United States. And at the Sunday Law, Russia will die. It will be um, completely surrendered, like in World War I, where though the fighting stopped, on November 11, 1918, the war didn't fully end until June 20, 28, 19. Did I say 1914? 1919. The, the war didn't officially end until June 28, 1919. So that parallels Panium to the Sunday Law, where the Panium, the fighting south, and the Russians defeated is not fully defeated until the Sunday Law. The Spanish flu of 1918 and COVID-19 of 2019 are very much alike. We lined up the history of World War I with World War III. From that line upon line, we know that the Treaty of Resitov lined up with November 9, 2019. Eight days after the treaty, the Spanish flu pandemic began. Eight days after November 9, the COVID-19 pandemic began. Both viruses are highly contagious and affect the same population the hardest and require the same measures to mitigate the spread. So now I'm gonna read this article from CNN. A pandemic ravaged the world like wildfire, killing more than 50 million people globally and about 675,000 people in the US. The, day. the intensity and speed with which it struck were almost unimaginable, infecting one third of Earth's population, the World Health Organization said. That was the 1918 influenza pandemic. The virus was often called the Spanish flu, even though it didn't originate in Spain. Fast forward to 2020, the novel, and the novel coronavirus is also spreading with astonishing speed. 
Some of the painful lessons learned from the 1918 pandemic are still relevant today and could prevent an equally catastrophic outcome. Lesson one, don't let up on social distancing too soon. During the Spanish flu pandemic, people stopped distancing too early, leading to a second wave of infections that was deadlier than the first, epidemiologists say. In fact, one large gathering near the end of the first wave in 1918 helped fuel the deadlier second wave. In San Francisco, when the number of Spanish flu cases was almost down to zero, the city fathers said, let's open up the city. Let's have a great big parade downtown. We'll all take off our masks together. Two months later, because of that event, the great influenza pandemic came back roaring. On the other side of the U.S., in Philadelphia, Philadelphia suffered a similar fate. Even though 600 sailors from the Philadelphia Navy Yard had the Spanish flu in September 1918, the city didn't cancel a parade scheduled for September 28th. Three days later, Philadelphia had 635 new cases of the Spanish flu. according to the University of Pennsylvania Archives and Records Center. Quickly, Philadelphia became the city with the highest influenza death toll in the U.S. By contrast, St. Louis, which scheduled a similar parade but canceled it, fared much better. The next month, more than 10,000 people in Philadelphia died from pandemic flu, while the death toll in St. Louis did not rise above 700. The U.S. CDC said, of course, different places will look different, will reach different peaks at different times, but just because one place moves past a so-called peak with coronavirus doesn't mean cases or deaths there can't rise again. The image that we have of this epidemic curve, we say we're going to reach a peak. We look at it. It looks like Mount Fuji in our minds, a single solitary mountain. I don't think it's going to look like that. I think a better image is a wave of a tsunami with echo waves that follow. And it's up to us how big those other waves will be. Question. So all this unrest in the United States and other parts of the world will start off another wave. Yeah, most likely. Yeah, most likely. Yeah, I think there are two, three Spanish flu waves and most likely gonna be more than one. COVID wave. Lesson two, young healthy adults can be victims of their strong immune systems. The 1918 pandemic killed many young adults who were otherwise healthy, said John M. Berry, professor at the University of Public Health and Tropical Medicine. About two thirds of the deaths then were among people ages 18 to 50 and the peak age for death was 28. In the years leading up to the 1918 flu pandemic, the life expectancy in the U.S. was in the early 50s. But in just one year after it struck, the average U.S. life expectancy dropped by 12 years. As of 2017, the average U.S. life expectancy was 78.6 years. And with coronavirus, the elderly and those with underlying health problems are at higher risk for severe complications. Yet many young, healthy people are also getting severely sick with or dying from COVID-19. One reason that the 1918 flu was so deadly for young adults was because the outbreak started during World War I, when many soldiers were in barracks and close, in close proximity with each other. The U.S. military training camps obviously had high mortality. There, no World War now, which there is, but important lessons remain. Young, healthy people are not invincible, and their strong immune systems might work against them. Looking back at the Spanish flu, scientists now believe an immune system overreaction contributed to high death rates among the otherwise healthy young adults in 1918. A century after that pandemic, hyperactive immune systems could also be contributing to young people's deaths from coronavirus, CNN chief medical correspondent correspondent Dr. Sanjay Gupta said. These overly strong responses are often called something I can't pronounce. In some young healthy people, a very reactive immune system could lead to a massive inflammatory storm that could overwhelm the lungs and other organs. 
in those cases, it's not an age or weakened immune system that is the problem. It's one that works too well. Lesson three, don't throw unproven drugs at the virus. Yes, there have been major medical and technological advances in the past 102 years, but the Spanish flu and the novel coronavirus pandemic share two major challenges, the lack of a vaccine and the lack of a cure. Back in 1918, remedies varied from newly developed drugs to oils and herbs. The therapy was much less scientific than the diagnostics as the drugs had no clear explanatory theory of action. In 2020, there is widespread speculation about whether hydroxychloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, a drug used to treat malaria and two other diseases could help coronavirus patients. President Donald Trump has touted hydroxychloroquine saying, what do you have to lose? Take it. It'll be like a gift from heaven. That's what he says. <laughs> After that, some started hoarding the drug, even <laughs> though it's still being tested and might not even work against coronavirus. A, re okay. a recent study found hydroxychloroquine did not help hospitalize coronavirus patients. Instead, some patients developed abnormal heart rhythms. This provides evidence that hydroxychloroquine does not apparently treat patients with COVID-19. Even worse, there were side effects caused by, caused by the drug, heart toxicities that required it to be discontinued. Doctors in Brazil and Sweden have also raised concerns about using chloroquine, a drug very similar to hydroxychloroquine, on coronavirus patients because of heart problems. The bottom line, it's still not clear whether some drugs will cause more harm than good in the fight against coronavirus. End of that article. The seven last plagues of Revelation 16 and the Spanish flu of World War I are both proof that COVID-19 is an event of Bible prophecy that is supposed to take place in this time in history. So, now that we've done with that chart. article. Oh, so this chart. is a chart of COVID-19 and the Spanish flu. So the Spanish flu and COVID-19 are both highly contagious and they originated from animals, Spanish flu from birds and the COVID-19 from bats. You can mitigate the spread of COVID-19 and from uh, the Spanish flu by social distancing. People were told to wear masks and stay home most of the time. It began Spanish flu began eight days after the Treaty of Resetov, and COVID-19 began eight days after November 9th, and they both spread through the, can spread through the air from a cough or sneeze, that's why you need to wear a mask, so you sneeze into the mask, and then you inhale the COVID-19 that you just, Wait, if you what? have it. And uh, Susan says, since COVID-19 is an actual plague like virus and is fulfilling one of the seven last plagues of this dispensation. Are we also expecting six more plagues to follow or will each successive wave of this cover, 19 will be the fulfillment, like wave COVID two, COVID-19 be the fulfillment, like wave two being a second plague and wave three being a third. I understand that those, that these are not the Daniel 12 one final plagues. Well, there are, there most likely there will be different ways. I don't exactly know if they'll be different, if they will be considered different plagues, but like Elder Tess was saying in Portugal, there's like a locust plague going on in Africa. So COVID-19 isn't the only problem that's going on this year. So there are more plagues. So like if you include the locust, that's already two. But I'm not even, I don't even think you would have to have exactly seven because this is a fractal. So it can't be the exact yeah, we're same. Taking it literally. Yeah, we're not taking it literally, just like you're not taking the second coming or close of probation literally. Would, would racism be a plague? No, no because I racism has so. been around for forever. So it's you can't consider it a plague now. Uh, another question. Do you think that the economy will recover after the pandemic is over? Uh, um, it, well, didn't there's, we used to say there was an economic boom between now and pandemic? That's future so American the theology. Um, but will the economy recover? It, it won't be 
I will. I have no idea. It probably will not get back to the same way that it was before coronavirus. But it might get a little bit better. Because you know all the experts are saying it's all going to be great. We're going to be all stronger than ever. But, I mean, they got better after the Spanish flu, yeah. So, possibly, I I don't really know. And will there be a second wave? Yes. Yes. I think that's what the doctors are saying. It, there was a second wave of the Spanish flu, and then also the doctors are saying that there will be a second wave in the fall. So, yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately. You're welcome. Okay. So, so we saw that the close of probation was 2019. And then the seven last plagues came. Did we show the plague? And we had the death decree. Yeah, but did we show the No. You didn't? No. Oh. That was a mistake. Well, we were supposed to show this line no, before. No, we weren't. We weren't? After this one is... Isn't. No, this is he has a death decree. Third one. Like, we did show this line before. before. We did? Yeah, I'm okay. Saying. But anyway, the closed probation of 2019, the seven last plays are COVID-19, and now the death decree. Question. No, it's a quote. Exodus 15, 26. Thank you for the quote. Yes, thank you. So death decree. After the close of probation, which is Daniel 12, 1, there will be an increase of knowledge, just like in all other dispensations. That way, Mark, is the death decree. The same argument, this is quoting, it is from the Great Controversy, page 615, paragraph 2, and page 616, paragraph 1. The same argument many countries ago, many centuries ago, was brought against Christ by the rulers of the people. It is expedient for us, said the wily Caiaphas, that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish, not John 11.50. This argument will appear conclusive and a decree will finally be issued against those who hallow the Sabbath of the fourth commandment. Denouncing them as deserving of the severest punishment and giving the people liberty after a certain time to put them to death, put them to death. The people of God will then be plunged into those scenes of affliction and distress described by the prophet at the time of Jacob's trouble. Thus saith the Lord, we have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. Our faces are turned into paleness. Alas, for the day is great so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved, but he shall be saved out of it. Jeremiah 30, verse 5 through 7. So, in quote, the death decree is the increase of knowledge on the second coming in the dispensation right now in parallels 2021. We will also have some form of Jacob's time of trouble at that time. That time is this year. So the death decree is 2020, the increase of knowledge, and is increase of knowledge on the second coming, and it's also during the time of trouble, which we saw the seven last plagues. And, and what is the question from Bella Lokina, are you asking, do we know the date that the Spanish flu started? Oh, do have the reference to the date of it? They know it. Oh, do they have the reference to the Spanish flu beginning on March 11th? You can just look at Wikipedia. Yeah, if you just search when did this, when was the first case, when was the first case of Spanish flu? Oh, no. If you just search when's the first case, it's, you should find it, you'll find it. But we don't exactly have a reference. We did not read a quote. We wrote that. Oh. The voice of God. The voice of God. The formalization in that history, that history being the close of probation to the second coming, is the voice of God. This 
This will be when we get the day and hour of Christ coming, which is time. Great Controversy, 640, paragraph 2. Yes. Some say March 4th, Spanish flu. Okay. Well, some we people, would like, we like the one that they Some did. people say March 4th, Spanish flu. But according to prophecy, since COVID-19 is eight days later, they have to be wrong. Unless they are also saying that it would be, I don't know, they, people are always going to have different views, but we are using the March 11th perspective. Great Controversy 640.2 says, The voice of God is heard from heaven, declaring the day and hour of Jesus' coming and delivering the everlasting covenant to his people. Like peals of loudest thunder, his words roll through the earth. The Israel of God stand listening with their eyes fixed upward. Their countenances are lighted up with his glory and shine as did the face of Moses when he came down from Sinai. The wicked cannot look upon them. And when the blessing is pronounced on those who have honored God by keeping his Sabbath holy, there is a mighty shout of victory. End quote. Of course, we know that God won't be speaking from heaven. Literally, we'll understand the day and hour of Jesus is coming through the lines and parable teaching. At the formalization of this dispensation, we will get the exact date of Panium, which is the second coming for the priest. And we won't understand the date through calendars and math. The second coming. The last way mark on all lines can be represented by the second advent because that's the end of God's work on earth and therefore the end of the reform line. The last way mark on the last dispensation of the last dispensation of the priest is 2021. At the actual second coming on the 144,000s line, the line will end and they will begin teaching all the other people in heaven. Similarly, at 2021, the line of the priest ends and we will take on a new role, teaching the Levites and the Nethanim. Quote from the next paragraph. Yeah, GC 640.3. Soon there appears in the east a small black cloud about half the size of a man's hand. It is the cloud which surrounds the Savior and which seems in the distance to be shrouded in darkness. The people of God know this is to be the sign of the Son of Man. In solemn silence, they gaze upon it as it draws nearer the earth, becoming lighter and more glorious, until it is a great white cloud, its base a glory like consuming fire, and above it the rainbow of the covenant. Jesus rides forth as a mighty conqueror, not now a man of sorrows to drink the bitter cup of shame and woe. He comes, victor in heaven and earth, to judge the living and the dead. Faithful and true, in righteousness he doth judge, judge and make war. And the armies which were in heaven, Revelation 19, 11, and 14, follow him. With anthems of celestial melody, the holy angels, a vast, unnumbered throne, attend him on his way. The firmament seems filled with radiant forms, 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. No human being can portray the scene. No mortal mind is adequate to conceive the splendor. His glory covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise, and his brightness was as the light, the back of three, three and four. As the living cloud comes still nearer, every eye beholds the prince of life. No crown of thorn now mars that sacred head, but a diadem of glory rests on his holy brow. His countenance outshines the dazzling brightness of the noonday sun. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Revelation 19, 16. So this is the line of the last line, 2019 to 2021. So in summary of this dispensation we looked at, one of the main dis one of the main dispensations that we use to illustrate dispensation of the priest that we are in well, that we are in now is the dispensation of the closing probation to the second coming. 
both are the last dispensation of their line. The close of probation is November 9, 2019, which was the close of probation for the priests. Next comes the seven last plagues, which represents COVID-19, or the severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2. That's SARS. Yeah, that's the actual virus particle. Technical. So we also looked at World War I and saw how COVID-19 parallels the Spanish flu. Both pandemics started eight days after the Waymark, that is the end of the Eastern Front, November 9 or March 3, 1918. Then back to the close of probation, to the second coming dispensation, we looked at the death decree, which is the increase of knowledge for us in 2020. Then the voice of God gives his people the day and hour of Jesus' coming, which is time. That is the formalization where we will get the time for Panium. Lastly, Panium is the second coming for the priests. The actual second coming and 2021 are the last way mark on the 144,000 line and on the priest line, respectively. So the second coming is the last way mark and 2021 is the last way mark. So we do have the summary slides, but obviously we don't have time to go over them. Yes, Any questions? Yes, yes we do. We go over what um, First we have to answer. Yeah. If any idea what the death decree is in the dispensation of the priests, what would it look like? Is it already passed? So no, the death decree is not passed because the death decree will be this year in 2020, but not yet. So the death decree is coming this year. And so it, it, but it and won't obviously be, it's not going to look yeah. like the op, the death decree that Sister White speaks about because it's just not. We just know that's well, not. Well, because we can't take the close of probation in 2019 is a literal Daniel 12 1. The second coming in 2021 is the literal second coming. Christ isn't going to come in 2021. So we can't say the death decree is a literal death decree. We do know um, the death decree is an increase of knowledge. So, death decree. Whatever it looks like externally, we don't know. We just know what it looks like internally, which is the increase of knowledge. And five minutes. Wait, I think that's good. Okay, so we're going to quickly summarize this presentation. So, in summary, we looked at four dispensations to line up with ours. The first was the baptism of Christ to the first temple cleansing. And what we want to focus on is the 40 days, the time period that we are in now. Was Christ fast and his the three temptations that he was tempted? Um, the three temptations of Christ, the three temptations that Christ faced, and they parallel they parallel us what the priests are going through right now. Temptation to lie on the Nathaniel's message to be presumptuous and to want an earthly kingdom. Yeah. Thank you for the the um, link, Richard, for the locusts attacking India. That's one of the seven last plagues. I don't remember it being out. It might be out. Question, be both. if the death decree is in the future, can we say that we are currently in Jacob's time of trouble, as this has been mentioned in recent presentations? Sure. So the Jacob death decree starts the time of trouble is what she's yeah. saying. Yes, technically Ellen White says the death decree begins Jacob's time of trouble. But yes, I do know we have been saying we're in Jacob's time of trouble now. So, so it's it's just two different perspectives that you have. You can see the death decree as being uh, the time of trouble as being the whole dispensation from close of probation to the second advent, or you can see it as just being starting as specific time. That would yeah, have to be the only explanation. It's just two perspectives. They're always, not always, but a lot of times you just have to use two different perspectives. Yeah. It was one more check. Since the Levites dispensation will have the seven last plagues, can we expect more pandemics after 2021? Yes, the 20, COVID-19 will not be the last pandemic that happens, I don't think. 
I mean, if it was in a fractal, we can't imagine what's going to happen in the actual yeah. seven last place. But it's as crazy. for the Levites, whether they will, whether their plague would be a pandemic, maybe, maybe not, but possibly. And that's not can you put the bottom line back on the chart? Yeah, he was saying it was getting cut off. Oh, is, is the chart okay. still cut off? It is cut off because he is cut off. Was that one? Oh, there we go. Thank you. Okay. Yes. That's correct. Yes. Yeah. All right. Because when you tap the screen, it makes it bigger. Sometimes. So the cross to Pentecost, which is 2019 to 2021, we lined up the cross with 2019, and that's when. Uh, the other side thought it was a failure, but it was actually success. And after that, you have the 40 days after his resurrection. Oh. Yeah. The 40 days after his resurrection with the three temptations. Three temptations. Yeah, not three temptations. You can line up the three temptations, but there are no three temptations. After his resurrection, he's reviewing the message with his disciples. Then after that, you have Pentecost with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and that's the formalization. And then we also have Pentecost again when the disciples begin their work, and we line that up with 2020. 2021. But then thirdly, we looked at the time period from the close of probation to the second coming, which is harvest. We lined up close of probation with 2019, which was the priest's close of probation. Which was the priest closed probation that began the priest harvest. The harvest was a separation, the priest from the church, which we can also see was the separation of the stone from the mountain. But it wasn't complete till the Levites are separated. And then the priest harvest ends at the second coming, which is 2021, which will be the end of the priest harvest, and they will go to the next group. Yes, I know. Time's up. Well, the, for the last. Yes. So for the final line we looked at was the closer probation to the second coming again. Closer probation is 2019. For the priest line, it was also the closer probation for the priest. The seven last plagues hit after the closer probation, which was Daniel 12.1. So on 2019, which was our close probation, seven last plagues hit. We saw COVID-19 and we also are seeing locusts attacking countries, which are also representing seven last plagues. Next, the death decree, which is the increase of knowledge comes, which will be this year, and we'll have an increase of knowledge on the second coming. Next, the voice of God, which is the formalization comes. That's where God announces time of Jesus coming, so the priests will get time from the lines at the formalization. And lastly, the second advent is where the priest's prediction will come true. That will be the priest's second advent and the end of the priest's line in 2021. And we'll transfer to the 144,000 line and begin teaching Levites. Okay. The end of this presentation. Anybody have any questions? Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, let's have closing prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for being with us through these presentations. Thank you for giving us understanding of the truths for this time and letting us know where we are in history and what's coming. Please continue to be with us. Thank you for calling us to be part of the 144,000. Thank you for providing for all of our needs and for keeping us safe. Please continue to be with us today. And thank you for always being with us. In Jesus' name, amen.